David Bell agrees with me. We're going to tell you exactly exactly what he agrees with coming up. Noel V. Marte had himself a day down in Dayton. Uh, we'll talk about that. And we are going to check in how our friends are doing since they were traded away at the trade deadline. We've got all that and more coming up right now on today's Locked on Reds. Let's go. You are Locked on Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked on Reds with myself, Jeff Carr, and my co-host, Stephen Offenbaker. We are lifelong Cincinnati Reds fans who have turned an addiction into information for you here on the Locked on Reds podcast. It's part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen every single day. We're free and available on all platforms. On today's episode, we are going to look at where some of the former Reds are in their seasons, whether you're talking about guys who were dealt in the off season or guys who just got dealt. And we're going to talk about something that uh, has gotten on to us when we're looking at David Bell and how we can evaluate guys moving forward, especially him and Nick crawl and things like that for the rest of this season. Plus Noel V Marte is on fire in Dayton, but first Steve, we got to get to this team and where they are for the rest of 2022, because we've talked about this ad nauseum evaluating them on wins and losses is not quite gonna work out. It's not. And, and you have said it a few times during the run up to the trade deadline, which is, you know, the second half of this season is basically spring, spring training 2.0. Uh, the reds really do need to give certain players opportunities to just go out there and play regardless of performance. Uh, you know, I said earlier, it is about repetitions. It's not about the statistics. It's not about wins and losses. Uh, but, uh, there's there's more than one spot we've tied that conversation to jose barrero and i want to get right to david bell agreeing with me jeffrey because just yesterday i said what should happen is kyle farmer should get reps at third base jose barrero should get to play shortstop and and approve it or move along half season to determine whether or not he really is a shortstop of the future and david bell came out today and said guess what folks that's Steve Offenbaker. He knows what he's talking about because <laughs> Kyle Farmer is going to play third base. He's going to get a lot of reps over there. Jose Barrero is going to start a lot of games at shortstop, and he's going to get the majority of his time at short. And that is exactly the way it should be for the second half of 2022. He invoked the name of Offenbaker. Yes, I, I do remember hearing him in the press conference. No, but he literally said Barrero to short. Farmer's going to play most of his time at third base, but Barrera is short every day. And applaud him on that. Because moving forward, we're not talking about guys that we need to evaluate on a daily basis. Repetitions without repercussions. That's what we're looking at right here because you're evaluating them on a much larger scale. How can they affect the future? And you're not going to know that on a daily basis. Th this game last night is the perfect example. Jose Barrera gets brought up. His first game is against the guy who's going to win the NL Cy Young this year. Firmly convinced of that. Sandy Alcantara, absolutely brilliant performance last night, shutting out the Reds, doing it on 105 pitches. The kind of performance that a pitcher from every era, whether you go all the way back to the dead ball era or not, they will be impressed with the way that he pitched last night because he was super efficient with how he did it. So how do guys react to that? How's Jose Barrera going to bounce back from the fact that, well, he just got brought up and he already has an offer on the docket. And how do you see the rest of this roster playing out? Because David Bell cannot be, he can't really manage it. Like he's managed the roster the last couple of years. No, uh, you know, David Bell, I think is, has improved over time with how he's done things. When he got here, he, he definitely was a little bit spastic. He just always seemed like he felt the need to do 
something. In this case, the only thing he really needs to do is put the young guys in positions to perform. When we talk about repetitions without repercussions, uh, I mean not only no repercussions for the players, you know, if they go 0 for 16, they don't need to be worrying about being benched. And likewise, if the Reds lose seven games in a row, Jeff, David Bell doesn't need to be worrying about his job. If the Reds yeah. lose seven games in a row, Nick Kroll doesn't need to be worrying about his job. The simple sad fact of the matter is this team is not going to be great for a couple of years. You know it. I know it. Our listeners, they know it. So David Bell needs a free hand to see what he's got on hand right now, who's valuable, who's not, to get an idea of what he wants to do in 2023. Because as we move closer and closer and talk more and more about that, Jeff, I think this team could be very surprising coming up. And the, the way to figure that out is to get these pieces in shape right now. You know, it's not just about Jose Barrero. You look at this outfield. What should the Reds and David Bell do with this outfield? If it were me right now, if they told me that I get to decide what it looks like the rest of the way, the majority of the playing time would look like Fairchild, Aristides Aquino, and Nick Senzel. I know that Almora Jr. has performed well. I know that he's back and he has moments of being streaky hot. But for me, he would be the fourth outfielder. He would give those other three guys rest because Almora, he's not in the long-term plans of this franchise. Aquino could be if by some miracle he finally figured out the breaking ball at the major league level. And Fairchild, uh, I think, deserves a, a shot to see if he could stick around and be a fourth guy, if he could continue to develop and be something for this roster. I think you're forgetting about somebody, though. Somebody who I think deserves a lot of playing time in the outfield. And that's Jake Fraley. Jake Fraley is the kind of guy that I think could be... Well, but before you dig into him any further, answer this question. Do you see him being in the 2024 plan for the Cincinnati Reds? In the same vein that we see Stuart Fairchild, Nick Senzel, all these. I think all of these guys are competing for the fourth outfield spot in 2020. Okay. All right. That's fair. Continue on. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I just I no, wanted no, to make no. sure I, what we were talking about. I, I definitely don't see him leading off for the 2024 Reds and playing center field. But I do think he could be a fourth outfield guy. But I'm with you. I think that there's dudes in here that the average fan is going to tune in and be like, who? Whoa. Why? Because also what you have to put with the repetitions without repercussions is you got to have some guys at the top of the lineup that really aren't going to make that much sense. Now, obviously, Jonathan India, he's going to be hitting leadoff. Moving him out of the leadoff spot doesn't make any sense. But in the second spot, I want to see some Nick Senzel. I want to see some Aristides Aquino. I want to see some Jose Barrero. Not because of merit, but because of repetitions. You get more at-bats when you bat second, Steve. I don't know. I mean, I'm not very good at math, but I know. When you're at Clearly. the top of the lineup, you get more at-bats than when you're at the bottom of the lineup. So I want to see Jose Barrero get those at-bats. I want to see Aquino because that's how you're going to work out the things that they need to work out and if they're going to work them out at all. That, that's absolutely correct. And listen, there's an even more complicated piece to this, Jeff, because uh, as much uh, as we're questioning what to do with some of these hitters and what kind of opportunities to give, uh, we spent a lot of time yesterday talking about the big three guns in this res rotation in Nick Lodolo, Hunter Green, and Graham Ashcraft. Now, when this season started, Jeff, I am, I'm certain that the, the brain trust within the Reds organization yeah. looked at these young pitchers and said, this is the number. This is the number of pitches slash innings we're going to let them throw in 2022. Now, I think the injury to Nick Lodolo took that off the table. As long as he's healthy the rest of the way, he can finish out this season and we don't have to worry about shutting him down. I don't think the same can be said for either Hunter Green or Graham Ashcraft. I think that that number could hit sometime in September. And my question to you then is this, do the Reds shut either one of those guys down early and who pitches if they do, or does it make sense to just keep running them out there, as you say, to get the repetitions? For those guys, I think they've got to stick to the plan because it is about the health. It is about the future. It is about what the long-term outlook is for Hunter Green and Graham Ashcraft. If they get to the point that the Reds have set, if, if Derek Johnson is sitting there with a calendar on his desk or on his wall and uh, he's got a thing that says this many innings or this many pitches or whatever, they hit it, they're done, go with it. I, I, I don't care how much of a tear they're on. I don't care how great of a streak they might be pitching or something like that. If they're in the middle of something awesome, 
whatever. That's fine. Still shut him down because it's about health and you don't want to overstretch a dude in a season, especially a season like this. That doesn't mean anything. Think back to Steven Strasburg's rookie year. They shut him down in the middle of a playoff race. They had something that they were going for, but they stuck to their plan. Now the long-term career of Steven Strasburg has been filled with injury. So we can debate whether or not the actual timing of said shutdown affects the long-term health of somebody. But at the end of the day, that needs to be the plan. And that needs to be stuck to not based on individual performances at the time. I agree. There has to be a point where they shut those guys down. I think you, you just nailed that Jeff at the end of the day, the, the long-term health of these pitchers and the importance that they have to this Reds long-term success. Uh, they absolutely have to be shut down when they hit whatever that number is. Now, I don't know what it is. It's, I don't, it's not been publicly stated anywhere. There's speculation about what it might look like, uh, but the Reds know what those numbers are, and they absolutely have to stick to it. Listen, I don't care if they have to go out and get some triple-A guy that has absolutely no chance of ever being a major league pitcher and give him a phone call and tell him, listen, we're about to make your dreams come true because you're going to come start for September for us, and then we're going to cut you, but you're going to be a major leaguer. I don't Anybody care what they have Tim to do. Anybody seen Tim Where's Tim? Sign him. Sign him today if that's what you've got to do. I mean, you know, uh, bring Cowboy down out of the booth and let him throw some innings. I don't (laughs) care. Whatever they have to do to protect those arms must be done. I 100% agree with you, Steve, because it's it's about development. And part of that development is keeping a dude healthy. And the Reds absolutely have to prioritize that. I, I agree. And listen, nobody, not David Bell, not Nick Crawl, not one single player on this roster should be judged based on the win-loss record. They need to just continue to go out and try and find success individually on the field for the greater good of the team down the road. Uh, and, and listen, Jeff, talking about having success for the greater good of the team down the road, down in Dayton, Noel V. Marte is doing his best to prove that he was the crown jewel of the Luis Castillo trade. Uh, we'll talk about that uh, in just a minute when we head down to the farm and talk about the day that he had for himself. But first, if you're looking to find that crown jewel for your special someone, head over to BlueNile.com right now. Whether you're ready to pop the question or you're celebrating a milestone moment, find jewelry as unique as her with the modern convenience of online shopping at BlueNile.com. You can build the engagement ring of her dreams. Blue Nile has simple online tools that let you choose the diamond shape shape, its size, and its clarity, as well as the setting style. Blue Nile's bench jewelers will then handcraft her perfect engagement ring, and it makes each and every ring they produce one of a kind. And if you're looking for fine jewelry to celebrate a special moment, but having trouble choosing, Blue Nile can help with that also. They have jewelry experts on hand 24-7, available via phone or chat to help you find a memorable gift at every budget. Make your moment sparkle with jewelry from BlueNile.com. And going on right now, Blue Nile Anniversary Sale will save you up to 40% on classic fine jewelry pieces and 25% off engagement ring settings. Plus, when you order, every order is insured, it ships for free, and it arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away the surprise that's inside. Shop stress-free and find your forever piece. Go to BlueNile.com today. Thanks again for making Locked on Reds your first listen every day because we are your team. We are right here covering the Reds every single day. After you're done listening to this episode, go check out the Locked on MLB Prospects podcast. Lindsey Crosby dives into the trades that sellers like the Reds made, and he will look at the talent and the future uh, that the Reds received in return and all of the teams across Major League Baseball as they look to upgrade their prospects at the trade deadline. The Locked on MLB prospects podcast is free and available everywhere you get your podcasts just like locked on reds all right jeff listen noel v Marte comes over in the luis castillo trade from the seattle mariners uh, we've got a collection of shortstops that are all looking to make a name for themselves. Ellie De La Cruz has been one of the fastest rising prospects in all of baseball. So there's a great uh, position battle uh, shaping up in the Reds minor leagues that's going to continue to develop and kind of marinate over the next couple years. But Noelvi Marti in Dayton had himself a day. I'm talking about not one bomb, but 
two bombs. And before we dive into this, I think uh, let's let's throw to our good friend out in Dayton, Jeff. Let's go to Tom Nichols on the call for Marte's second home run of the day in Dayton. And the pitch. High fly ball, left center field, well hit, giving chases Tommy Jew, way back, looks up, he's done it again. Home run Marte, his second of the game. A two homer game for new acquisition, Noel B. Marte. He hit one in the fifth inning and in almost the same spot, he hits another here in the eighth inning. Is that, that Hound's Tooth? Oh, yeah, yeah, that yeah. That was beautiful. That's a beautiful home run, but is that, is that Hound's Tooth on those Peoria uniforms? That was that was interesting. Um, no, no, that was amazing. Noel V. Marte, trust me, get up to date and go watch some Noel V. Marte because he has been tearing it up at the high A level for Seattle already before coming over in this trade. He's not going to be with the Dragons for very long. I mean, there's a lot of talent that's in double A, especially at the shortstop position because Ellie De La Cruz is there. But also, I mean, just the way that the Reds have everything stacked, I think they probably got to figure out what they're going to do with some of these guys because the way that he hit that and it's just like what tom said it was pretty much in the same spot as his first home run he's just he's just toying with guys at high a at this point he's ready for a promotion and listen, the, the success he had in Seattle, Jeff, that was not a small sample size. He had 394 plate appearances with Seattle's high A affiliate, and that's uh, good for a weighted runs created plus of 134. So 34% above league average uh, he was performing for Seattle at the time of his trade. You've got to love that. And he's up there at the top. No matter who you really talk to when they're ranking prospects, Marte and Ellie De La Cruz are the top two dudes for the Reds in their farm system. And Ellie's kind of been acclimating a little bit to double A. Oh, I think so. Uh, two. <laughs> At double A right now, his slash line's 244, 277, 444. Now that's a smaller sample size, Jeff. Just 47 plate appearances, two home runs, five steals, 10 games. Uh, that's not bad. That's a. For comparison's sake, though, Jeff, if you want to look at Marte and his 134 weighted runs created plus for high A, do you want to know what uh, Ellie De La Cruz's weighted runs created plus was at high A? Is it higher? 160 as in 60 percent above league average that is beautiful yeah whatever they decide to do with these two guys it is very evident to me that the future of this reds lineup is really going to be centered around these two because you're talking about two middle of the order guys two guys who have all of the talent, whether you're talking about speed, bat, power, all that other stuff, they've got the combination when it comes to the offensive side of the ball. And then Ellie De La Cruz is pretty good on, uh, pretty good with a glove. I know that there have been people saying that Marte is going to move to third base and things like that. He might not even move to third. He might move to like the outfield or something, but that's simply because you can only want to play one shortstop. Like, unless you just want to put nine guys there in between second and third, that'd be a really interesting shift. Although we are getting rid of the shift next year, so probably can't do that either. But you're going to have to move these guys around, whether you're talking about McLean, depending on if Jose Barrero pans out at shortstop too, you're going to have to move uh, Ellie De La Cruz. So th there's going to be lots of movement. And that's not necessarily because I've seen some folks compare that to what they did with Nick Senzel. That's not what we're talking about here. No, and uh, hopefully coming up, I've got some things in the work for us, Jeff, uh, coming up in the coming weeks where we may get to ask Matt McLean about that directly. Uh, I think that just as a little tease for something that might be coming up. But listen, with this season, I don't know if you caught a couple of the interviews that Sean Pender did uh, immediately following the the days leading up to this trade deadline. But what he said was with guys like Matt McLean that they've taken the approach of really pushing them and challenging them and moving them up quickly because they think that they can handle it. With Jose Barrero moving up to the big league club for the rest of this season, we think, it does create a spot at AAA. Now, if they're going to continue to push Matt McLean, I can see a scenario where he gets to move up to Louisville and that creates a spot at AA. We could see Marte and De La Cruz in the same lineup at the same time, flip-flopping back and forth between shortstop and third base, and that, would be fun to watch. That really would be fun. The Reds minor leagues are just going to be so much fun to watch. 
uh, for this year and for next year for some guys that aren't going to be necessarily ready to get called up next year. Um, we were talking about this a little bit, and we're going to dive into this a lot more later on. Spencer Steer is a guy who will probably see a little bit of AAA, and he might get called up pretty soon too. There's just so much talent now that the Reds have acquired, and I think that that is something that people are missing if they look at the trades that the Reds made and said, well, pfft, they're they're going to be back in 10 to 15 years. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I sometimes I think we should live stream our show prep because I would have loved for people to be able to see the absolute just dilemma I was struggling with whether or not he's a major leaguer right now. Like maybe I think he might be. Jeff, I think he could be. No, no, no. Wait, wait. I mean, I wrestled with that one for a long time. But uh he's definitely in a position where it could be justified either way to do some things with him this year or heading into opening day next year. And there's something about it, and again, we'll dive into this a little bit more, but he doesn't quite have a position right now. So I think they're trying to figure out where they want to slot him. But again, there's just so many dudes like Marte and De La Cruz are going to be the two guys that really form the future of this team, whether they pan out or not. If they don't pan out, I don't really want to talk about that right now. But <laughs> if they do pan out, this team is going to go places, man, because these two dudes are uber talented and they're going to fit somewhere on the field because they're going to fit in the lineup right there in the middle. Well, absolutely. The Reds, I think the big takeaway is that the Reds' top two prospects, Jeff, they are just slapping. Slapping. And I tell you what, Steve, um, there's another guy that's slapping. No, never mind. I guess he's not slapping right now. But we'll look at some guys that the Reds traded away and how they're debuting or slash how they're playing because the Reds traded them in the offseason. We're going to look at some uh, old friends and see how they're doing. But before we do that, we've got to look at some built bar because built bar is amazing. They've come up with some beautiful flavors and the most latest one is one you've got to get your hands on talking about cookie dough chunk puff. I don't even know that I need to do the rest of the read. I mean, that's pretty much all you need to. Okay. I guess I'll tell you a little bit more about it. They got about 160 calories in them. They're covered in 100% real chocolate and it's a marshmallow that has collagen protein in it. So your body absorbs it very quickly, very naturally, super healthy for you. You check it out at built.com today. Use the promo code lock 15. You'll save 15% off your next order. It's literally little chunks of cookie dough. That's covered in 100% real chocolate on a marshmallow. Fantastic. They got s'mores puffs tastes just like you're biting into something next to a campfire, except, you know, you don't have to get bit by mosquitoes to do it because you can just have it nice in your uh, snack cabinet and eat it inside your house. Go to belt.com today. Check out all of the new flavors, whether you're talking about puffs, you've got the regular bars, they've got granola bars. They've even got a bunch of different things. You can check out built.com promo code locked 15. Thanks again for making Locked On Reds your first listen of the day. Make sure you check us out tomorrow. We are going to have Peter Pratt on to talk about this Marlins series, and we'll have a little bit of a taste of an interview as Steve will be talking to Cade Hunter, the Reds' fifth-round pick from this most recent draft really looking forward to that he's got steve's had a great series this lefty in the bullpen stuff he's been able to talk to a bunch of different guys and like we said matt mcclain's coming up here soon a lot of different guys in the works really going to give you an inside look at everything going on in the minor leagues but steve let's uh let's look at an inside look at some old friends because well we're gonna be doing that a lot here because the reds traded everybody away as much as everybody likes to remind us and Luis Castillo, let's start with him because he debuted beautifully today. He did, uh, you know, he goes out and apparently Luis really likes pitching against the Yankees and <laughs> it, it might've helped that he was gifted a six run lead before he ever <sighs> set foot on the field in his Mariners uniform, but he goes six and two thirds, Jeff. He allows two, uh, he allows three earned runs, five hits, three base on balls, eight strikeouts against the Yankees lineup. That's not that bad. So uh, that was, I think, uh, a successful, great first outing for Luis Castillo playing for the Seattle Reds. 
pretty yeah really seattle res pretty uh, good introduction to the fans there in seattle and i think it might have been a strategy because as a couple of folks on red's twitter reminded us uh, garrett cole has struggled throughout his career the times that he has faced the reds obviously ever since he got traded by the pirates that's been less and less but he still doesn't have very good statistics against the reds maybe that's why seattle just loaded up on him they're like well if we face him in the playoffs guess what <laughs> I don't know that that's really a strategy though, but Hey, the other Seattle Reds, a Eugenio Suarez and Jesse Winker, a Eugenio is kind of having a little bit of a bounce back here. Uh, it's actually kind of a lot of bit of a bounce back here, Jeff. Now you look at his slash line and it doesn't just scream at you. It's 234, 333, 424. But here's the numbers that start to jump out at you. 17 home runs, 54 RBIs. And I know there are a lot of people that care about that RBI number. I'm talking to all of the Tony Perez guys. But listen, <laughs> we're going to get a lot of hate mail now, Jeff. Just I'm went sorry. there. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. You can send your mail to Jeff Carr at. <laughs> uh, at no, but listen. With 17, 17 home runs, 54 RBIs. That's good for an OPS plus of 119. Now, for comparative sake, in his last season in Cincinnati, his OPS plus, Jeff. 81. And I thought, I mean, even before the trade happened, I was like, Suarez is going to bounce back this year. I think it's a given and I'm, I'm being proven right there. Meanwhile, Jesse Winker, not so much. He's, he's right at league average. His OPS plus is right at a hundred, but his slash line is less impressive, especially on the slugging side of things. 226, 336 on base and his slugging is 347. That's not Jesse Winker. I don't know what happened to him out there in Seattle. Ooh, I know. I know. Oh. oh, he's way out there in Seattle. Uh, Jesse <laughs> Winker misses Great American Ballpark. Yeah, I think as a hitter, the reason that you like to be a Red is you get to play in Great American Ballpark. Like I mentioned yesterday, home run rate this year best in the majors, one and a half per nine, which that goes both ways. Pitchers don't like pitching in Great American Ballpark, but yeah, just not the best of years for Jesse Winker. Now, looking at a couple other dudes, Tommy Pham, he's played twice for the Red Sox ever since being traded for a player to be named later. Hey, he's got a hit, and every single game is a Red Sox. Two he hits. Does. Two hits, zero slaps. Zero slaps, yeah. No slaps. <laughs> Hadn't played Jock Peterson yet. And Brandon Drury debuted last night as a Padre. And guess what? That was also the same debut as Juan Soto, as Josh Bell. That lineup in San Diego, holy crap. And Juan Soto hit his first home. No. Mm -mm. Nope. Josh Bell hit his first home. Negative. No. Brandon Drury grand slam as he introduced himself to the Padres fans, a five run first inning. They had a run right before that. Uh, my goodness. They, they absolutely murdered the Rockies last night. That was, that was illegal what they did, but great to see that debut for him out in slam Diego. So slammed in Drury, anybody? Maybe look, you're, you're, you're going to have to switch shows, Jeff. If you're going to, if you're going to start making <laughs> nicknames for the other team's players, you're going to, you're going to get booted. No, but listen, Brandon Drury, I am so excited for him. Uh, you know, I have talked about him needing to be traded for a while now, and that had absolutely nothing to do with me not thinking that he's a great guy or me not thinking he was a valuable piece in a, in a puzzle for a good team. He is exactly where he needs to be. Now he's going to go to a team that can make a push for a postseason berth that can get some postseason baseball. Uh, Brandon Drury is going to cap this, this amazing out of nowhere season with the potential to continue and play for a world series. So, you you know, I am so happy for him getting traded out there and to have that kind of success when he clearly was not the story of the night making his debut. You know, you threw out all the other names already. That's where everybody was looking. That's where the reporters were gathered. That's where the cameras were pointed. And, and Brandon Drury said, well, let me introduce you to me. Let me introduce you to my little friend. Yeah, his bat was absolutely phenomenal that night for the Padres. And and more than more than that, like all of these guys, they're going to get to be in legitimate playoff races, especially Luis Castillo, man. He absolutely deserves to be highlighted on the biggest stage. And we're talking about his first start as a Mariner. He goes up against Garrett Cole in Yankee Stadium. Like that. Uh, doesn't get much bigger than that. I know he just did that as a red, but he's actually chasing something with the Mariners. They're, they've got a legitimate shot to really 
upset some folks in that AL playoff race. I, and I think it's great for the Seattle fan base that, you know, the team ran Castillo out there against the Yankees, against the team to beat. And he has that kind of success. And now the Seattle front office can say, this is why we paid that price. Yeah. This is why we gave up those guys. This is the player that's going to help get us over the top. Yeah, and, and I totally agree with our Mariners guys in that I am super happy with the return that the Reds got. I love the prospects that we got. But as a Mariners fan, you're happy with that trade because guess what? You got Luis Castillo, and now you get a legitimate shot to make a playoff run. So I'm, I'm happy for him, happy for the guys that the Reds traded away because they deserve that playoff run. I'm pretty sure you said Seattle got fleeced. I have some hate mail directed in your direction <laughs> that that would back up that yeah, statement. But I'm you know, seeing it from their point of view. <laughs> I, I hear you, Jeff. That's, that's probably a great place to go ahead and wrap it up for today, Jeff. Listen, uh, that's going to do it for us today. Coming up on tomorrow's podcast, we are going to sit down with Peter Pratt and break down this Marlin series down in Miami as the Reds have an off day. I'm also going to share a little bit of an interview that I just completed with Cade Hunter, the Reds' fifth round draft pick from this season uh, at the catcher position. It's going to be an exciting episode. Can't wait for you to hear it. Thanks for making Locked On Reds your first listen. Now, go make your second listen, the Locked On MLB podcast. Paul Francis Sullivan brings you humor, passion, and his unique perspective on every team and the biggest stories around the league. Follow the number one daily league-wide podcast, Locked On MLB. It is on the Audacity app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Jeff, that's going to do it for us today. The season is underway. We have set a direction. What can the fans expect from us? We will be following this team, and we will bring them their daily Reds and hopefully help them feel better about being Reds fans during this time because we are locked on Reds every single day.